Buenos dias. Hola. That is all of my Spanish. <laughs> Thank you very much, translators. You are amazing. Uh, I get very excited about the work that I do, and it makes me speak quite quickly. So if I if there's like shouting from the back, can you let me know? Because it will be the translators saying, be quiet, be quiet. I can see myself on the screen. Oh, I'm there as well. Oh my god, slides, please. <laughs> They're coming. Anytime now. Oh, here we go. Brilliant. All right. I work here at the Government Digital Service, and we deal in revolution and not evolution. And we do that because of this lady at the top. Her name is Dame Martha Lane Fox. When she wrote her report in October 2010, she wasn't a Dane, but she is now, thanks to her brilliant work in helping government digital to get so much better. And also, she's very interested in making sure that people who don't have digital skills and digital access are getting online as well. The guy on the bottom, his name is Francis Moore. He's the Minister for the Cabinet Office. And the Cabinet Office in the UK government is right in the middle of government. And they're in charge of making sure that all of the civil servants, the people who work for government, are doing a good job and working efficiently and effectively. And he asked Martha to write a report because he'd seen, like many of us have seen, that government and IT projects usually equals catastrophe. I don't know what it's like for you here, but in the UK, we've got a long history of very big, very expensive, very terrible IT projects. And Francis thought that probably we could do things differently. And Martha, she was a co-founder of a dot-com uh, startup, lastminute.com. It was very successful in the very first dot-com boom. Uh, so she learned a lot about how to make good digital services that people want to use. And he asked her to write a report, and she came back with four recommendations. Number one was to bring digital talent back into government. So what we have done in government was that we have outsourced all of our technology, and with that, all of the people who knew anything about how to do internet well, how to make good IT and technology decisions. And Martha said, bring them back in so that they can help government make better, smarter decisions. And then she said, fix publishing. So at the time of this report, there were probably thousands of government websites. And to navigate through them, you had to know which department did what. And then it was designed in however they felt like designing it at the time. And it was crazy and expensive and hard to use. She said, bring it all into one place. So people don't have to know how government works just to get things done. And then design that well in a user-centered way. And that's number two. Number three is to fix transactions. So the things that the citizens need to do with government, put them online and make them easy to use. And the fourth was to go home wholesale. So to do it in a very open way, so that we were providing open source code and APIs, so that commercial companies then could come and help us fix government problems as well. We didn't have to do it all ourselves. So the first project, and the one probably that we are best known for, is GovUK. Has anybody, how many of you have heard of gov.uk? A few, yeah, okay. So for the rest of you who haven't, don't worry, I've got a video, and that will get you up to speed in a couple of minutes. Hi, I'm Adi Adiwami, I work at the Government Digital Service, and I'm here to tell you about gov.uk. Okay. We launched gov.uk in October 2012. It replaced the two big central government websites, DirectGov and BusinessLink. The idea was to make something simpler, clearer and faster, something focused on users. Firstly, we took a careful look and worked out what services and information we actually needed to deliver. We thought, for instance, that we could probably stop spending taxpayers' money telling people how to have a when abroad or how to identify different kinds of waves. We eliminated thousands of pages that no one ever visited. Then we made sure that the information we were providing was as easy to find and to follow as possible. This, for example, is the page on DirectGov that tells you about bank holidays. Now, it has all the information you need, and you'd think it'd be hard to do it better. 
But looking at how people actually use the site, we realised that what most people were searching for was the date of the next bank holiday. So we put that right at the top of the page, big and bold. We've done the same thing to more complex tasks, like working out how much maternity pay you're entitled to. Before, on DirectGov, you'd need to read all this information. On gov.uk, you just need to answer a few simple questions and the site calculates the answer for you. In April 2013, we finished moving all departmental sites to gov.uk, together with the sites for number 10 and the Deputy Prime Minister's office. So instead of every government page having a different design and different navigation, every site now looks and works the same way. At the same time, we've rethought how policy is presented online. Before gov.uk, if you wanted to understand government policy on something like gangs, for instance, you'd have needed to visit all these separate pages. Now, there's a single page for each policy, and all the departments involved share the responsibility for keeping it up to date. You can even subscribe to those policy pages so that you're always kept informed of any changes. And if you're responsible for a particular policy, you can find out how often it's being looked at and how closely it's being read. Today, gov.uk is handling more web traffic than the sites it replaced at a far lower cost, and users get to the information they need quicker than they did before. gov.uk is not perfect, and it's not finished. It's never going to be. It's designed to improve, to react to user needs. We've made thousands of changes to gov.uk, and we make small improvements almost every day. This idea, iterative, responsive change, is at the heart of everything we do. You should visit us at www.gov.uk. Hopefully, you'll see something you like. Something simpler, clearer and faster. So that's Gov.uk. We're quite proud of it, but it still has a long way to go before it is as good as we want it to be. There's a lot of work to do. That is just one of the projects that we're working on, though. And there are many other big things that we're doing. One is the transformation project. In the transformation project, we're working with our colleagues in departments to transform 25 of the biggest transactions in government. So this is things to do with driving, or tax, or benefits, or passports, all of those things. Uh, and we're working with people in each of the departments to make sure that these services are redesigned so that they're easier to use. But we're also working with the people in departments to make sure that they've got the skills and the capabilities to, and the, the right kind of people in place to be able to keep doing these kind of projects by themselves with support from us but without having GDS to do everything for them. So that's a really huge thing to be able to have a load of government departments who are working in agile user-centered processes and that we're using you know, contemporary and appropriate technology. And then we've got this other one, this is the Identity Project. This is the one that I actually joined GDS to start working on. Um, so if you're coming to GovUK to uh, get a new passport, say, it's quite important that we know that it's definitely you on the other end of the computer. So this is a very important requirement for doing things digital by default. Uh, and in the UK, we've got a special challenge, which is that they voted against identity cards. So we can't have one single database with everybody in it. We have to design what they call a federated approach, which means that a citizen can come in and choose who they want to identify them to government. Government can't own all of the identification. So as you can imagine, that's a pretty hard thing to build technically, but it's even harder to try to explain that to a normal person, how that works. So that's been a big challenge for us, but it's, it's up now and it's, and it's working and it's live. And this is something that's being used now for people to access information about driving and for them to be able to do different things on their tax account. Uh, and it's a big deal. People have talked about this for a long time and now we've actually made it a real thing. So these are the kinds of projects that we're working on in government. And our goal is to make projects, make services that are so good that people prefer to use them. Not that they get really much of a choice of which government they have or whether or not they pay tax. But they can choose to do it on paper, or they can choose to do it by calling on the telephone. And those ways for us as taxpayers and for government are much more expensive than if we do it online. 
So if we can create services that people prefer to do digitally because they're better than the other ways that they can do them, then citizens get a better experience and taxpayers spend less money on each of these transactions. So that's, that's a really good thing. So each of these individual projects are really interesting. But what I think is the most interesting is how do you go from a situation where you have a government, uh, an organization that is renowned for its IT catastrophes and get to a situation where you can reasonably reliably expect them to do a fairly good job of technology now. I won't say for, you know, for a moment that we are the best at this, but we're an awful lot better than what we used to be. The, the transformation from there to here is very big. And how has that happened? And how can you think about how you can apply that in your government and in your organization as well? So this is kind of thinking about how do you change the DNA of the organization so that they can start to make better products on a regular basis. And that's what I think is really interesting. There are lots of things, obviously, that contribute to that. But there's four things today that I want to talk about because they're things that you can actually do right now to contribute to your organization. <laughs> this is my first one. Show, don't tell, number one. This is something that you will hear people saying at GDS all the time. Uh, it relates to this idea that we don't really care very much about what you say you're going to do. We only care about what you're doing, what you've done, and what you can show us. Uh, so, you know, we don't care about proposals, and we don't care about strategies, and all that kind of thing. We care about actually seeing the code, actually seeing the thing that's being done. So this means if, you, if you're working in that kind of a team, you can't have a strategy department over there and a technology department over there. They have to work together because the strategy people, the people who are coming up with the ideas, have to be very close to the people who can actually make the ideas. So we join that, you know, the strategy and the delivery much, much closer together. And we make big signs that keep reminding us that it's not important to talk about what you're going to do. You know, it's more important to show the thing and talk about it, actually show it. And here's the thing that I can show you. This is something that goes right back to the beginning of the time of GDS, probably even before GDS was actually a real organization. This is a screenshot of the alpha version of WK. So the very earliest, very earliest version of WK, it was never intended to be the site that actual citizens would use to get that information. This was like the proposal to do the project. So instead of writing a business case, or writing a set of requirements, or writing a big PowerPoint app. They made a prototype. They, they actually made the thing, a small version of the thing that they wanted to make in the future. And then they could take this to Francis Lord, the Minister for the Cabinet Office, and go, this, this is what we should be doing. And he could look at this and he goes, this is much better than what we're doing right now. I like this. I like that big picture. That's shiny. The big picture was never going to go live, but it was part of this, the shiny strategy to get people excited about wanting to do a project. And then Francis Ward could take this to another minister because this is on the internet. It's you know, at the URL, it's made out of HTML. You can show it to another minister and go, yeah, have a look at this. What do you think of this? And then you go, ooh, that's nice. I like that. We should have some of that. And then gradually people could get excited about this and go, we definitely we need to do that thing with the big picture of the Olympics on the front. You know, we need to, we need, that's what we should be doing. Why are we doing this? Somebody start doing this immediately. And that's what prototypes do. That's what making the thing does, right? In a way that making a set of requirements or a proposal will never do. You make a prototype, you make the thing, and you show it to people, they start to get excited about it. And things that, if you talked about it in theory, would sound impossible, all of a sudden, they, you start to think, Maybe we could do this. I can see it. Look, how hard would it be? And things that seem really terrifying, actually, when you see it, you go, I think we can do it. I think we can do it. You know, you gain confidence. It feels, it's, you know, it's already on the internet. How hard could it be to make this a real thing? Um, I, I quite like this thing that Simon Willis, who is a, the co-founder of Lanyard, says, which is that, you know, you think about the amount of meetings that you're in, talking about the project and what we're going to do or what we can do or what we can't do, all of that boring stuff. If you took that time, you probably could have already built the prototype. 
So we try to spend less time arguing between ourselves about what we're going to do and what's going to work, and we spend more time just making it and testing it and proving it. So if you have a stakeholder who has a crazy idea, don't sit in a meeting room and argue with them. Don't write long documents and emails. Make it. Put it in front of users. Show. Show that it's crazy. And similarly, if you have an idea that's fantastic that nobody believes, exactly the same thing. Make it. Show it to people. Demonstrate that is a really brilliant idea, an amazing idea. But, and this is where the people who love Azure start to hate me. I have never seen an organization get excited about a pretend prototype. I don't know why. I'm sure Azure is fine for many things. But you never get people really excited to make a big, exciting thing with an Azure prototype or with some OmniGraph or wireframes. It, it has to be made of HTML and it has to live on the internet. And it actually doesn't really seem to matter how good it looks. It can still look pretty crappy and it doesn't have to be production ready code. There's something about the fact that it's made of the internet and it lives on the internet that gets people really excited. That's what really motivates people to, to go and tackle exciting projects. Um, so, if you don't believe me, I'm not going to sit here and try and prove it to you. Try it for yourself. And what you will do by experimenting with prototyping your code is you will get a whole lot of other benefits as well. And you can write to me and thank me later. <laughs> so that's number one, show, don't tell. Number two is ask for less. So, I work with a guy whose name is Russell. He is very, very grumpy, very grumpy man. Uh, but he's also very clever. So I'm going to let him introduce this, because he does quite a good job of it, I think. But when he says planner, I want you to think designer, or UX person, or whatever your job is. Replace planner with your job. What's the most important, what are the most important skills for a planner to have? Then? Um. I actually think the, the most important thing a planner can do is get people to do stuff because that is the largest problem for all organisations is people don't do anything. So you're sort of taught as a planner that, that, your, that your skills are to do with you know, strategy and cleverness and devising original ideas and things, all of which is useless if no one does anything. So you start to realize that your job is to, to devise strategies that will get people to do stuff. Um, so as a very junior planner, your job is maybe to get a creative team to do something. And, as you, you know, and then maybe your job becomes getting a hold of an account to do something. And as you get, basically as you get more senior, your job is to get larger amounts of people to do something. Um, so eventually you end up being a person who gets multinational corporations to do something. I think a lot of the time it doesn't matter what, just it just something <laughs> is kind of the, the challenge. So I hope you didn't mumble too much for the translators to be able to make sense of that. But the essence of it is that you know the, our the biggest problem in organisations is that people don't do anything, and that our job is not to be clever and come up with amazing ideas. Our job is to work out how to get people to do something. And in a lot of cases, it doesn't matter exactly what the thing is. It's just more important that we actually get them doing something at all, that we get them on the right pathway, that we get them moving towards where they need to be. Um, if you have children, who's got kids? Anyone got small kids? Yeah. If you don't, you might remember this from your possibly very recent childhood. <laughs> five-year-old at bedtime. Picture a five-year-old at bedtime, right? This is how early in our lives we learn kind of obstructing and delaying tactics, right? So think that about how many years of experience your managers have of obstructing and delaying stuff, except instead of having a tantrum or wanting another glass of water or needing to go to the toilet, They've got business cases, or processes, or committees, or reports. 
They've got grown-up ways of putting off the thing that they don't want to do. And the thing that they don't want to do is to make a big, brave decision. Big, brave ideas are awesome as long as you're not the person who has to decide whether or not we're going to fund it. Whether or not that's the thing that we're going to put all of our effort and our budget behind. If you're the person who has to make that decision, big, brave ideas are terrifying. They're very scary. And that's why we have steering committees. And that's why we have requirements, documentation in an excessive way. So if you want to help to make big, brave things happen, you need to work out how to work with human nature and not against it. Don't terrify your managers. Um, so what this means basically is to start to think incrementally, to start to think about how you can get them to make a small, not so scary decision that puts them on the pathway towards the big idea. So you keep your big ideas in your head and you share them with, with kind of trustworthy people who aren't responsible for the budget. But when you're talking to senior people, when you're talking to managers, you talk about small, manageable, not scary ideas, and ones that you can measure whether or not they're successful. Because if you've got data that shows, or evidence that shows that your thing is doing well, you know what a successful project is like. All of a sudden, everybody wants to be on that team, right? And that was everybody else's idea first. And that's a good thing. This is what you want. You want senior people to see your little tiny small thing and go, aha, that has potential. And I know what it needs to be. It needs to be this big, enormous, great thing. And as soon as you start doing little things that show potential, that have got data that show that you might be on the right track, you will start to get a lot more senior sponsorship. So the challenge is then to start to think about what do you ask for? What do you pitch? What's the kind of smallest thing that you can come up with? What's the thing that you can ask people to do that won't scare them off into steering committees and report making and all of that kind of thing? How can you simplify what you're asking of your organization so you can get them on the right pathway without even them necessarily knowing where they're going to? So for WK, that was to ask for the alpha. That was, you know, the, the Olympics picture on the front version that we saw before. That was a, a, a small team that had about 12 weeks, I think, to put that together. And that's what they asked for, was just enough time for enough people to make the alpha. And they got that, and then they got the beta, and then the, there's WK, and you know, there's all of the other stuff that we get to do as well. What's the equivalent for you in your project? And it could be that it's a project that you want to do, a service that you want to design, or it could be a behavior that you want to change. So for me, in government, the role that I have is to try to change government behavior, and that's to try to encourage government to do more user research, to spend more time actually understanding who their citizens are, and what their needs are, and what works well for them, and what doesn't work for them at all. And this is not something that government has traditionally done very much of. They like to go and talk to kind of expert groups, but they don't really go anywhere near actual end users very often. So that was the behavior that we wanted to change. And the thing that we did was to start to ask for very small, simple things. So this was the first thing that we asked for. We said, just do user research in every sprint, because we work in Agile. So this means usually every two weeks, go and do some research. And this is the research that you should do. Get five people, bring them into a lab, talk to them for a little while, and then do some usability testing. Just do that. That's all you need to do. And if you guys know anything about user research, you will be sitting there going, but that's not the right thing for every project. That's good for some things, but that's not good for everything. And I completely agree with you, but we needed to get away from it depends, which I, I, don't, I should have learned the Spanish and Portuguese translation for it depends. I don't know whether you do the same thing as what we do in English, but for us, if somebody comes in and they go, hey, I've got this project, I need to do these things, what do you think I should do? Designers and researchers, UX people, Usually, the first thing out of our mouth is, well, it depends. Because that's true, it does depend. But the minute you say it depends, you're saying it's complicated. I'll have to think about it, I'll have to work, like, do all of these things and work out the, the, the solution to this complicated thing. And the minute somebody thinks that something is complicated, they go, okay, stop, we need a process. I'm gonna need a form, I'm gonna need a report, I'm gonna need a process, I'm probably have, gonna have to procure something. 
I'd love to hear what the word for that in Spanish is. It's probably rude. Um, so we, we kind of knew that if we, if we just stopped us, ourselves from saying it depends, and if we just said, do this, just do this, that they, people would start doing this. Oh, I can do that. That doesn't sound so hard. I can do that. And if they start doing this, then they start getting the right kind of people and the right kind of experience and the right kind of skills and they understand what it's like and the value of seeing end users. And then they come back to me and they go, that advice that you gave me, that was okay. It was a bit basic. Really what we need to do is we need to go out and do some contextual research and we should talk to these people and that people and what about accessibility? And I go, you're right, you're right. It was very basic advice. You should really go and do all of those things that you're talking about. And that's great, because if I asked them to do all of the things, they would have done nothing. But if I asked them to do this, then they want to do all of the things, because they've developed knowledge and sophistication, they're able to do it. This is another one that we talk about all the time, get your exposure hours. So Jared School, who probably many of you know, he talks about exposure hours and, and it sounds a little bit rude, but actually all that it means is that you need to make sure that everybody in your team, from the big decision makers all the way through, are seeing real people using your product at least two hours every six weeks. Who has teams who are doing that now? Who has actually seen an end user using the service that they're working on right now in the last six weeks? Wow, that's really bad. So, Jared's research says that of all of the things that you can do in your team, hiring more designers, hiring senior designers, using Azure, using Agile, of all of the things that you can do, this is the thing that will make the biggest difference in your team's ability to actually design and deliver a good service. So take that little nugget home and use that. And it makes research what we call a team sport means that everybody has to participate, and if they're not, they're, they're completely letting the team down. This lady is not unusual. I could show you clip after clip after clip after clip of problems that people have with long drop downs, with long select boxes. Uh, and we've known about this problem for a long time. This is an article from 14 years ago saying that we shouldn't be designing stuff like that, and yet, as you know, that kind of thing is everywhere. Everywhere. And I don't know if you could tell from the tone of her voice how frustrated and embarrassed she was to be struggling like that, just trying to put her date of birth in. She felt horrible. And I don't know if that's the user experience that you're going for. It wasn't what we were going for. We weren't very happy with that. But if we replaced that with just little text input boxes instead of drop downs, she would have flown through that with no problems at all. And I think this is a big lesson for us. I don't know what the other speakers are gonna talk about over the next two days. I'm sure it will be fantastic. But I think it's very easy for us to get carried away with the kind of the sexy, exciting parts. You know, oh, the future, the future. And we've, you know, I think we've got a few things that we need to sort out before we get too carried away with what the future looks like. If you would like to see more of this, Alice Bartlett, who also works at GDS, does a wonderful talk on YouTube called Burn Your Select Tags and goes very deeply into this topic. And this is a little bit of a tangent for me, but I, I really, I think it's so important. And given that you guys are here for interaction design, it seemed appropriate. So getting back to my, my, my ask for less, number two thing. This is not just about user research. I use it as an excuse to talk about user research because that's what I care about, amongst other things. But for you, it's the question of like, if you want to start a big project or if you want to create big behavior change in your organization, then what are the little things? What's the little thing that you can ask for that's not scary, that's easy to do, that's gonna get people on the right path? It's gonna help them to understand more about what you're asking them to do so that they can come back to you and go, well, that was, that was okay advice, right? But really, we should be doing the big thing. And you can quietly go, yeah, I know, I know. But then you can go, yeah, brilliant, that's a good idea. Let's do it. Okay, number three, change the language of the organization. 
This is the scariest one for me today because it's very dependent on translation. This is all about being really thoughtful about the words that you use when you talk every day. There is a lady in London, her name is Jill Arout, and she is a linguistic analyst. And so what she does is she looks at the words that companies use when they talk about themselves. So, you know, their brochures, what's on their website, their mission statements, all of that kind of thing. And then she goes into the company and she looks at the words that they actually use. So when they're in meetings, how do they talk? What do they actually call things? In their documents that they write to each other, the emails that they write to each other, what kind of words do they use there? And as you can imagine, there is usually a gap between what the company says it believes in and what it actually believes in. And she says, you know, that, that the words that you use, uh, they, they give you a really good sense of what the real values of those organizations are. So th think for a moment about an organization that starts their project with requirements gathering, and then think of another organization that starts theirs with user needs. All right? So think about what kinds of things, what kinds of practices, what kinds of documents, what kinds of things do each of those organizations care about? Requirements gathering, user needs. They're kind of the same thing. They're the thing that you do at the beginning of the project to get a sense of what needs to be done in the project. But those two terms tell you so much about what each of those organizations values. So at GDS, we are user needs driven. Uh, this is Liam Maxwell, he's the Chief Technology Officer for the whole of government. And he talks about user needs so much that he had to have it printed on his phone. That says, what is the user need? And we build it into our design principles. User needs are number one on our design principles. We have a way that we assess whether or not a project is kind of fit to go live or not. The number one criteria is about user needs. We put these little things on our windows so we can look out and keep reminding ourselves who are we doing this for? And in our methodology, the very beginning of our methodology is about user needs. So it's not just something that we say, although we do say it a lot, it's baked into the way that we work. Every day, every day, every day, we talk about and we think about and we prioritize user needs. I feel the same way about user experience. So we're very careful about the way that we use the term user experience. And the reason for that is because the vast majority of the UX challenges that come down for our end users are not to do with the way that the drop downs are designed, believe it or not. They're challenges that come from policy or from security or from the person who's decided that you've got that much money to deliver it in that much time. They are the people who make the, the experience of the service really difficult for our end users. So we have researchers and we have designers and they work together to do user-centered design because no matter how great your designers are and how much research you do, you can't make bad policy go away by making the form better. It doesn't work. So we believe that user experience is the responsibility of the entire team. And we say that and we point to our friends in policy and we say, people don't understand this question, or well, this question makes them feel really frightened and uncomfortable, and they come and they watch the research and they change policy decisions because of the information that we are giving them in our user-centered process, and they become a part of the, the team who are interested in user experience. So if we have a, a, a subsection of the team who is called the UX team, or if we have a person who is called the UX guy, that doesn't, doesn't make any sense if at the same time we're also trying to say, but it's all, of our, it's all of our jobs. So we had to think about calling ourselves different things so that we could really live this belief. I think the same thing about you know, usability testing and user testing. So you hear people say user testing all the time. And you know, it doesn't really matter. But for us, we, we, we be pedantic about it and it gives us a little moment to always make people think. We don't test the users, we test our own work. And in government, where you know, there is this mentality of, well, we just make the rules, you don't have to like them. This is a little moment for us to keep turning that around, keep turning that around. It's a little moment of shifting the culture all the time. I think that the words that you choose to use tell you a lot about what you believe in. 
a lot of the time, this is completely unconscious, but if you start thinking about it and you start being deliberate about it, you win little moments every single day where you get to challenge that culture and you get to start to shift it around to what it should be. Okay, this is my last one. Make your job mostly about communications. So how many of you are designers? How many of you are researchers? Not very many, apparently. So uh, how many of you are UX people? How many people haven't put their hands up yet? Okay, I'll talk to you later. Um, <clears throat> Whatever it is that you think that you do, probably you should be doing less of that and more communicating. And when I'm talking about communicating, I'm talking about the communicating that you're doing within your team, within your organization. It's this idea that if nobody knows what you're planning and what you're doing, it's kind of almost as though you're not doing it. And if you're in a little corner doing it, then the whole, all of the things that everybody else could be thinking about and planning can completely change. And then you come out and go, ta-da, here's my thing. And they're like, well, it's all changed, dude. It's all completely changed. Or in our case, um, in our case, we were doing you know, loads of research. We, we, we won the battle to get researchers in, and we were doing lots of research. We were like, why is nobody doing anything about our research? It's such great research. Why are they not doing anything? And we realized that it was because we weren't spending enough time communicating. And I always think about this. If you think about the parts of your organization that are just broken, that are toxic and horrible and, and everyone hates each other or there's like these big problems all of the time, well, what would happen if the only thing that you did was be more thoughtful about the communication, do more communication? Every time I do that test on a problem, it's like 80% of the problems all go away. And there's, there's always a reason, what, like the seed, but you can get rid of a lot of the toxicity and a lot of the, the confusion, and then you can focus on what the actual problem is. But you achieve that through communication, through behaving like a human being. So yeah, we sort of learned that actually when it came to user research, a user researcher was really only researching about 30% of the time. And the 70% of the time they spent thinking about how they could actually communicate what they knew better to the team that they were working with. Uh, and that was a really important moment for us when we realized that, first of all, we couldn't just say it once. We couldn't just get up at show and tell and go, blah, 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 here's what we know. Okay, great, you've all got it now. Brilliant, I can go and do the next bit of research. You have to keep saying the same thing over and over and over and over again. And it's only at the point when somebody finally comes back and goes, I've heard that before. Can you not tell me something new? that you go, finally, okay, now they've actually really heard it. I mean, every, just because you've said it doesn't mean that the communication has actually happened. So we've ended up in a situation where we've got like an internal comms strategy for our user research team because we've realized that this is so important. And it's got kind of three main parts to it. This one down the bottom is like, what we would do loads of all of the time because we do a lot of work in Agile. We do the research every sprint. We come back, we go, okay, here's what needs fixing. We write the stories, they run the stories, and the product gets better, and that's great. Um, but what happens with that is that people just, once you put it on the wall, it becomes the thing that the developers and, and the designers do. And people have kind of forgot that the reason that it was there was research. So they're like, so what value has research added lately? Not much, what do they do? They don't make anything. Um, so we had to start focusing on these other two things. So the top one is around empathy. So one of the most important things that we can do is we can keep reminding the people in our teams that the rest of the people in the world are really different to us. Uh, and that, that actually we, we are the unusual group because we have the technical capabilities and, and the domain knowledge that we do. We're the weird ones. This, and this is what the rest of the world is like. And we have to keep bringing that in all the time and breaking down this notion that, that you know, people are like us, so we should design for people like us. And we do that through um, 
this is a, just a Google group at the moment. We'll probably turn it into something fancier like a blog. This is our MVP. We make a Google group when we're going out to do research. And we say, if you want to hear about the childcare research, sign up to our Google group. And every day then, the researchers will just kind of write up a story of the people that they went and met and put photos in there and tell the stories. And these are really, really popular with people on the team. They love hearing stories. They love seeing pictures of other people's lives. So it's a really, really powerful thing to do. It takes time. So the guys go out, they do their field work. Now they have to like set aside a good hour to sit down and write this up and send it out to the team. Um, but it's so, so, so worthwhile in terms of the engagement that we get from the rest of the organization in the research that we're doing. And then these are the shiny things that we make. They're just kind of simple, you know, diagrams a lot of the time. But these, we were talking before about like show the thing, making the things, very important. In our organization, if you're making things, you know, you, your work is valued. So the fact that research wasn't making things meant that I think we were less valued than we should have been. So we've started making things. And these are just like ways that teams can hold big knowledge. Like they understand like the big things that we're learning when we go out there. But they're also really important just in terms of us showing that we are adding value to the team as well in a really visible way. And we try to make these things so that anybody in the team can sit down and just kind of sketch them. They go, like, right, here's what you need to know about childcare. You need to know, you know that it's an emotional, financial, and logistical choice. Because a lot of people think that it's just financial. And that's actually not true at all. And then we still do loads of stories. It's, you know, this is, at the end of the day, this is the most important thing that we do, is we help contribute to the teams to every day make services better and better. So communication doesn't just happen, obviously. We do communicate with each other, but we need to take responsibility for whether or not that communication is actually landing. You know, you, communication is only happening if the message that you're trying to get across is actually effectively getting there. So you have to change the way that you think about communication and take responsibility for whether or not your message is getting across and be really thoughtful about what you need to do in order to make sure that it does get across. So that could be thinking of a kind of an internal comm strategy for your team, or it could just be saying, you know what, we need to block out time. You know, we need to actually block out a day a week just to do comms, which sounds outrageous. But then when we think about it, we go, well, if nobody knows about the research that we're doing, then is there any point doing it at all? We might as well not be here if nobody actually knows about it. So this is how important communications is, and it has to be deliberate. You have to really think, what are we gonna do about this? How are we gonna show that it's rewarded? How are we gonna help people fit it into their calendar? It has to be a thing that we do. So those are my four things. Show, don't tell, ask for less, change the language, do more communications. All of those things are free. All of those things are things that you can do starting today. And we do all of this because we want people to actually do things. We want to actually make better things and get better things into the world because you know, the strategy shouldn't be some document in a PowerPoint that nobody ever looks at. The strategy needs to be delivery. And that is me. Thank you very much. <laughs>